So we are very fortunate to have Beverly Bond with us today. As a mentor, activist, philanthropist, and one of the world's premier DJs, Ms. B Ms. Bond founded Black Girls Rock. It's a nonprofit. Yeah, you can clap for that. And I loved on their website it's, that says that Black Girls Rock is more than a statement. It's more than an organization. It's more than award ceremony. It too is a movement. And this organization works and inspires and provides leadership opportunities to girls 12 to 17 through the arts. In 2010, Beverly partnered with BET to share her Black Girls Rock vision with the rest of the world and was the executive producer on the network's most successful broadcast to date, centering on Black Girls Rock. She didn't stop there. She's also added an awards program, a music tour, Scratch DJ Academy, how would you like to do that? <laughs> Rhyme Like a Girl Poetry Workshop, she's probably gonna tell us, maybe start out with a little poetry. All focused on celebrating, supporting, and developing the talents of girls and women. Beverly's work as a community leader has earned her a number of prestigious recognition. She was recognized as Essence, one of Essence Magazine's 40 fierce and fabulous women who are changing the world and has been chosen as one of the most influential black people in America. With such diverse talents combined with an unparalleled and passionate devotion to music and to community, Beverly is determined to make a difference in the lives she touches that stretches further than the ordinary boundaries, a true testament to reaching for the stars and a true champion for mentoring in voice and action. It is quite an honor to be here today. I am only one year over my fear of public speaking. <laughs> But then I was told that I had really big shoes to fill because the first lady was actually the keynote speaker for this panel last year, so that gave me a relapse. <laughs> so I wore these really tall shoes. And I keep saying, yes I can. Yes, I can. In addition to wearing tall shoes, I also wear many, many hats. Um, I am a former fashion model I'm a writer, I'm an executive television producer, I'm a CEO, and I am a celebrity DJ. But I'm nice too, I'm not just, <laughs> I'm not just wearing the title. Um, but what I'm most proud of, and the reason that I'm here today following in Mrs. Obama's footsteps is because I am an activist, I'm an advocate for youth, and I'm a mentor. Legendary actress Ruby Dee recently said that as human beings, while we are on this earth, that we each are given an assignment from the creator to do something to help to further humanity and that our life's journey is about finding out what our assignment is. As a room full of mentors and educators and youth advocates and stakeholders who are engaged in youth development, who've already picked up the weighty task of becoming visionary and dedicated in your service to humanity, you all have already found your assignments and it is an honor to be amongst you. I'm gonna start with you, Tiani. Um, let me ask you a question. Where do you think that you would be if it were not for the college bound program? If it wasn't for college, Can if you pull it was the mic not closer for to you? college bound, I believe that I would either be pregnant, dead, or somewhere that is not safe for myself. Um, why do you think, like what, what, what about the college bound program changed your uh, thinking? Sorry. I had people that cared at college bound. It wasn't just my mentor, everybody cared. They, they saw something in, my, in me that I didn't see in myself. And I just needed that extra push that I didn't receive at home. Wow. I think that that is, um, that really sums up. I think I learned about mentoring, first of all, on a personal level from having, I, my mom and dad were wonderful people and I grew up with them. 
But I also had uncles who were my dad's brothers who really, when my dad didn't come down on me, they did. And, and I learned in a very positive way and I learned a lot from that and, and tried to do that in my career as an educator. I think I learned as a middle school principal especially how invaluable mentoring programs were when I had a group of fathers come to me and say that they wanted to start a mentoring program. This is when I was at Parkland Middle School in Rockville. And we, we called it the Concerned Black Men of Parkland was the title that uh, was given to the group. And it was, it was phenomenal. I don't have enough time to go into details. But those kinds of things, and mentoring can take many different shapes. It just doesn't have to be the the one-on-one. -on -one. It can be through businesses and organizations and schools. It doesn't just have to be the traditional one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I saw many changes in these four years working in Big Brothers Big Sisters. People like Jonathan and his mentor, Ron Hines. I mean, he was there for him unconditionally. He did everything possible to make things happen for him. Because being a mentor is not for everyone. He was very consistent in many activities, providing fun, and obviously, most important of them, encouraging him determination in life. I mean, it's what I saw now after, you know, I matched them when I started with Big Brothers Big Sisters. And what I saw today, and what you are a witness of that, is, you know, I, I saw a young fellow who's going to be one day very successful. And we were talking on the way here about what do you learn from Ron? And he said, well, Ron is a marine corps. You know, Samper Fi, never left your partner behind. But what do you really, I mean, besides that, you learn about his excellent background, you know. And he said, well, Ron, encouraged me determination in life. I wouldn't be here right now, it wasn't because he really knew how to do that. Many people get together, they connect, they have fun as a mentor and mentee, but just few, day, few of them got a real connection. This is the reason because they stick around and they will be for a long period. The question was how has the mentoring relationship helped you <laughs> in any problems and, and challenges that you have? Oh, okay. So, um, but that was good too. Mr. Cunningham would help me uh, study. He talk, I talked to him about the problems that I would have at home or at school, stuff of that nature. So, and then he will give me um, helpful advice about that. Good. In your relationship with Chad, how do you feel that you've enhanced his life? <laughs> well, I said both. He's, he's also enhanced my life. I think uh, <laughs> Chad is an excellent individual. He's, he's a wonderful person. Um, he's smart. He's intelligent. Um, needs a little push every now and then to do that homework or get things turned in. But um, here's a kid who had about a 2.4 GPA when we first started with him. He's now a 4.0 GPA. Kevin, um, I wanted to ask you a few questions. I know we're running out of time, but what keeps you going in this relationship and what keeps you going in the program? Um, I just uh, first like to say that I really appreciate the opportunity being here. My coworker Sam and some of the other young people that we work with there at a the table here. And what keeps us going in this program and my relationship with Devondre is that I see him making choices to stay alive and free. Um, the young people um, in our city, they die at an alarming rate. We're a little over 100,000 people, um, but we rank in the top 10 in homicides every single year. And so the young people that we work with, they're confronted by this gun violence every single day and they have to negotiate their lives. So as, as proud as I am of Devondre, I also recognize that when we leave DC and we go back home, he has to go back to negotiating every single day to go to school and to go to work. So the fact that he's able to prevail, although all these things are against him, it gives me um, the drive and the determination to continue working with a young man who despite all the odds, he made the best of a situation. And 
I heard that you both were invited guests to the State of the Union address. Bye. Was it, was it our president that invited you? Are you cool like that? You and you and the president cool? Yeah, you know. Yeah, you say either. yeah, you know. <laughs> no, tell us about. After tell us about. We leave here. We're going to the White House. You know, so. I mean, no. that must be a, a huge, um, just from from where you were, yeah. to now being invited to the State of the Union address with the president. I mean, how how does that? What does that do for you? When I first got the news, I turned it down. Like I was, I was afraid. Like it was hard to believe. Like, what do you mean you turned it down? Like I got a phone call in the morning. <laughs> I got a phone call in the morning. Like you going to see Obama? I was like, nah, I ain't going. <laughs> what did you think you were in trouble? Like, what? <laughs> it was it's, it's like it, it's really hard. It was hard to believe at the time. The first time it was hard to believe. Like. I can't believe what's happening right now. I know I've been on this good path and doing what I got to do to be safe in my environment and make sure I stay away from the temptation because it's heavy. And I never thought it'd lead to me sitting, being one out of 600 people to hear Obama speak about what's going on with the United States. So it's like, and some of that stuff he was talking about, I don't pay attention. So I'm going to be honest, like I don't, get all into the politics and be on it like that. I politic like street politics, I know that. But when it comes to the president, like he was saying some things that I been knew was going in my environment, but he was speaking more than just my environment. He was talking about the whole United States of America. So it just brightened my horizon. It made me think when I get home, all my fans and family, I'm going to let them know. Y'all better get on y'all job because <laughs> it's, it's real.